Good morning, Tri-City. You're listening to Dollars with Cents. I'm Ella Lang. And I'm Terrence Vanderwood, and we're your two financial gurus back this week with another important discussion around permanent life insurance. You may remember we talked about whole life insurance in our episode called Send Junior to Uni when we referred to the money tree concept where the apples are the cash values available to pick off the tree after your investment, which are your premiums you have paid, have grown over a period of 20 years. Yes, a fantastic compliment to your children's RESPs when you begin your financial planning around their education. Today, we'll look at a uni- what a universal life insurance has to offer. Both provide a rock-solid lifetime coverage and tax-advantage cash growth opportunity, but they're structured differently. Knowing what these differences are and how they could affect your portfolio are important considerations when choosing which one best suits your needs, risk profile, and comfort level. As usual, we're trying to keep our explanations as simple as possible, so don't get scared off because the topic is about life insurance. Ella and I want to show you out there how you can use insurance as an asset allocation to grow your wealth. Who doesn't want to know more about how to make your money grow, right? So stay tuned to Dollars with Cents and we'll be right back. Welcome back to Dollars with Cents. Terrence and I will speak to you for the next 15 minutes or so about options one has to develop a rock solid foundation in your financial plan through permanent life insurance. If you're just tuning in, whole life versus universal, both permanent insurance policies with certainly common features, but major differences as well that you should know about that will open up options you may not know existed out there to help grow and protect your wealth. Just for fun, I was curious as to how far back in time people who had been using life insurance in their overall planning. Apparently, the sale of life insurance in the U.S. began in the 1760s. The Presbyterian synods in Philadelphia and New York City created the Corporation for Relief of Poor and Distressed Widows and Children of Presbyterian Ministers. Wow, that's the world's longest title. <laughs> in 1759. So, Esca- oh, you're going to make me say this, aren't you, Ella? Episcopalian priests uh, uh, organized a similar fund in 1769. Between 1787 and 1837, more than two dozen life insurance companies were started, but fewer than half a dozen survived. Amazing. That's over 250 years ago. Yes, uh, 250 years ago. Uh, So it's been around for a long time. But it goes to show you that the need has obviously always been there and the industry has grown and evolved with the times. We'll show you a chart a little later on regarding the history of rate of returns. One of the companies we represent in particular has offered over the last 25 years, regardless of the events that have negatively or positively influenced the markets. But first, Ella. Talk us through what features exist in both whole life and universal life insurances. Sure, that's easy. Both participating and universal life insurance offer permanent lifetime insurance coverage. Universal life insurance offers flexible payment options of 10, 15, 20 years or life. Participating life insurance offers a guaranteed payment period of... 20 years. Both options allow you to use the money within the policy to pay for your insurance and both participating whole life and universal life insurance offer a guaranteed death benefit which is the basic amount of life insurance you purchase. Okay so both have lifetime insurance coverage, guaranteed premiums options and guaranteed death benefits. Here's where they differ. The participating account assets in a whole life insurance policy are chosen and managed by experts within the insurance company. They are professional asset managers providing competitive participating account returns with a focus on stability. A universal universal life insurance 
on the other hand, allows you to manage the risk profile and choose investment options within the policy. So if you're looking to invest, you're able to select the investments in your policy according to your risk profile, giving greater flexibility in how and where you invest. Needless to say, the markets affect the returns on this type of policy on this type of policy. And on the flip side, in the whole life insurance, you can see a consistent and stable rate of return year after year. Remember that chart Terrence mentioned a little earlier? Here's what we have on rate of returns from one of our insurance companies we thought we'd share with you. Even during times of economic uncertainty, Canada Life's participating account dividend scale interest rate has been relatively stable compared with many other financial in instruments and indices. We've taken a snippet of what the last 30 years look like. Year after year, the return table from the Canada Life dividend scale interest rate performance has managed relative stability in comparison with the S&P TSX composite index. Government of Canada long bond index returns and the consumer price index. See how the recession, looking at the chart, see how the recession in 1990, the dot-com bubble popping in 2000 and the 9-11 tragedy in, in 2001, and then finally the recession in 2008 affected the composite. Compare that to the rate of returns for the dividends within the insurance policy. No one can guarantee those rates with mutual funds or stocks, not even Warren Buffett. So that's where you participate in the experience of the participating account, along with the other policy owners, and may benefit from the earnings in the participating account through dividends. That's not the structure within a universal life insurance policy. Just a reminder, listeners, if we're going too fast, you can read the transcripts of today's show on our Facebook page, Dollars With Sense, or listen to the podcast again. The chart we are referring to will be in both places too. Of course, if you wish to address us with specific questions, feel free to email Terrence and I at two financial gurus, that's the number two, financial gurus at gmail.com. And here's something to consider regarding your cash flow when choosing what type of permanent insurance is for you. If you have a consistent income, participating life insurance provides a guaranteed premium that's easy to budget for. If your income is cyclical, universal life insurance provides you with flexibility payment options. You can pay more upfront to compensate for times when your money may be tied up elsewhere. And for all you savvy investors out there, if you prefer to be in control when selecting the investments in your policy, returns in a universal life insurance are based on the investments you choose from the options under the policy. If you're more comfortable choosing how your money is managed, again, universal life insurance may be ideal for you. You can customize how and where your funds are directed. If you're comfortable with more variability in your returns because of the potential upside in returns, you can be more equity-based in your choices. You can choose uh, a conservative or balance weighting. Again, the choice is yours. A participating life insurance can be looked upon as like a fixed income type of asset. Uh, the, inset, the investments in the participating account are invested to an approximate weighting of 20% equities and 80% fixed income, providing stable returns. When we come back from the short break, we will take a look at what permanent life helps you achieve, whether it's a whole life or universal life insurance. You're listening to Ella and Terrence, your two financial gurus. Welcome back. Taxes. Boo, right? Are you paying too much to the tax man? Well, 42% of Canadians surveyed agree that reducing the amount of taxes they pay is an important, immediate financial goal. We've talked about the variety of strategies on how to reduce your taxes, as we are so preoccupied with taxes that we are paying now. But have you ever stopped and thought about the tax that will be owing on your assets to the tax man when you pass on? We're going to dedicate the next 10 minutes to inform you about the income tax liability your estate could incur 
without proper plans in place and some of the options to minimize and pay this tax. You may be asking why. Because you don't want to make the tax man a beneficiary of your estate. That's right, Ella. In the eyes of the tax man, you are deemed to have disposed of your property in the year of your death. This basically means that from the tax perspective, the government treats your property as if you had sold it on the day you pass on. For example, 100% of the value of your RSP or RIF may become taxable. More than like in most situations, it will become taxable. Your personal representative, the executor of your state, is required to include the value of these plans as income when your tax return is filed for the year of your death. And this may, in all likelihood, put you in the highest marginal tax bracket, if you're not already there. This could mean taxes in the 46% tax bracket in BC, perhaps higher due to the clawback of the old age security pension. In addition, you will have to pay taxes on the appreciation in any capital property you may own outside of a registered plan. Presently, 50% of the increase in value of your capital property must be included as income on your final tax return and taxed at your marginal tax rate. Once again, the inclusion of income may put you into a higher tax bracket in the year of your death. Let's take a simple example of capital gains tax. George purchases a mutual fund for $10,000. The mutual fund is worth $20,000 when he dies and the appreciation value is $10,000. 50% of the $10,000 is taxable. So George's personal representative must include that $10,000 as income and pay tax on $5,000 on George's behalf. Focusing on capital gains for a moment, the following are examples of types of capital property you may own that may result in capital gains tax either when you sell it or have due to a deemed disposition when you die. So all investments such as mutual funds and stocks, bonds, if held outside of the registered plan, in most cases will be taxable. If you own a cottage, the increase in value becomes taxable. Owning rental property, land, a business, including a farm and shares of small business corporation, as well as other appreciable assets such as antique cars or artwork uh, can all result in capital gains tax when you die. The thing to remember is that you only pay capital gains tax if the capital property, property has increased in value since you purchased it and if the asset is not bequeathed to your spouse or common law partner. A tax-deferred rollover of farm property to a child may also be possible. If the property has declined in value, you have a capital loss, which can be used to offset other capital gains you may incur on another property. Capital losses un unable to be applied against capital gains may be used to offset income from all sources in the year of death. The immediate prior year subject to certain limitations. So as you can see, if you own these types of assets, depending on the increase in value, your estate could face a significant tax bill, hence making the Canada Revenue Agency, the CRA, an unintended beneficiary of your estate. Thinking about the heirs of your estate, what are possible solutions to covering this tax bite? One of the best methods is the spousal or common law partner rollover. You can defer tax until the spouse's death, but the tax liability may continue to build while their surviving spouse owns the assets, if the asset appreciates in value, of course. The spouse or common law partner rollover option doesn't solve the problem. It merely postpones the potential growing tax liability. If your personal representative and your heirs decide to save the tang tangible assets of the estate from a forced sale, they must come up with enough money to pay the tax liability. Well, what are their options? 
Your heirs could pay the taxes out of their own income or assets. This would be done uh, with after-tax dollars, assuming they even have the available funds, making this an expensive solution compared to other options. Um, your heirs could borrow money to cover the tax liability on your estate. What will the terms of the loan or amortization period and interest rate be? Can your heirs afford this loan? Are they prepared to take on a huge after-tax loan repayment burden? Finally, your executor could sell some of the estate assets to cover the tax liability, but such sales may attract an additional income tax liability. Sold assets are gone forever, and forced sales can cause serious losses if you can't receive a fair price for the assets. Stop and think about all this sometime. Ask yourselves, is this what you want? There are many solutions, like for example, you may wish to use last to die permanent insurance to provide tax-free funds upon the second spouse's death to offset the estate liabilities, including tax on capital gains. Last to die insurance would ensure both your lives under one policy and the proceeds would be payable on the death of the second to die spouse. This type of insurance is considerably less expensive than permanent insurance, ensuring only one of your lives, since the point at which the proceeds will be paid will probably be many years after the expected point at which a claim under a single life policy would be made. Life insurance is a viable and commonly used solution to the tax liability problem as it creates ready liquidity. Life insurance guarantees the future delivery of a certain amount of money. Your accountant can team up with a financial planner to figure out those numbers, so it doesn't have to be a daunting task. Once you have those no numbers, you can choose the appropriate permanent insurance for you to cover taxes owing, and no one has to scramble for expensive solutions. And remember, the price of life insurance will never be less expensive for you than it is today. And why? As we grow older, the cost for new life insurance increases. The earlier permanent life insurance is purchased, the lower the cost will be. By now, it should be apparent that you need to implement an estate equalization strategy. The most common solution is to purchase permanent life insurance, often last to die insurance that insures two individuals in order to create enough estate assets that can be an, that can enable a fair and equitable distribution to your heirs after tax. Insured inheritance strategy is designed for individuals who have annual tax obligations from non-registered investments, have a desire to reduce taxes on investment income, want to leave their inheritance for their heirs, and want to control their legacy. Uh, we've got to take a break and we'll come back with a little more our your action item and also a special event that we got coming up in the near future. Don't uh, touch that dial. We'll be right back with Dollars with Cents. Welcome back, everyone. Before we go, um, we'd just like to invite you to a special event we're very proud to promote here on Dollars with Cents as Investors Group is sponsoring the 10th annual Walk for Alzheimer's Make Memories Matter. In BC, over 70,000 people are living with dementia, and sadly, this number is growing. The Alzheimer's Society of BC supports those diagnosed with Alzheimer's and dementia, as well as their families, but they really need our help. On Sunday, May 1st, gather your friends, your family, children, community members, work colleagues, neighbors, and register at noon at the Hyde Creek Recreation Center gymnasium it's 1379 laurier sorry laurier avenue port coquitlam and walk the trabulae poco trail is that correct yeah, trabulae beautiful trail. trabulae poco trail in port coquitlam beautiful port coquitlam bc between 1 and 3 p.m it's not a full day commitment plus the weather will be sunny and warm uh, what a great way to get some exercise enjoy some fresh air and catch up and spend quality time with your community. Each investors group walk for Alzheimer's is held in honor of somebody in our community. 
We, ha we are pleased to announce that the Tri-City Chambers and the Ridge Meadows Walk 2016 honoree is Douglas Charles. You can read more about Douglas Charles on, his, on the website www.walkforalzheimers.ca. That's where you'll find uh, a walk in your neighborhood where you can donate to a participant or team through the website. Or you can participate by either forming a team, joining an existing team, or registering as an individual. Our goal is to reach 5,000 walkers in the Lower Mainland. So among us walkers, May 1st will be Tri-City Councillors, Mayors, uh, our MLAs, and MPs. Um, so far, we've raised over $8,000, so thank you so much. Um, but we, yeah, help us raise more to continue supporting those afflicted with this devastating disease. Let's make memories matter. Sign up. Once again, that's www.walkforalzheimers.ca. Thanks, Ella, for that. And uh, thanks to Investors Group for putting that together. Uh, it's an annual event, as we said, and it's really something special that uh, uh, this company takes to heart. So there's a two-fold action item for two types of different people. So one, if you're going to leave money behind for someone else, including a charity, as your financial guru, uh, I would say that you have the duty to make sure your money uh, goes to your heirs in the most efficient way possible. In order to do that, you need to have an estate tax analysis done with your financial planner or possibly your accountant if they're a, a good accountant on top of all of that. So again, that action item is an estate tax analysis. Secondhand, for those who are the heirs, your action items, or I would suggest that is your duty, is to make sure that the people who are leaving the money behind have a proper estate tax plan in place. Either your parents, your grandparents, business owners, Again, you have the choice when dealing with estate taxes to either pay the government or your favorite charity. Because when you designate a registered charity as a, the beneficiary of a life insurance policy, your estate will receive a 100% tax deductible receipt. What uh, Ella and I, your financial gurus, do for our clients is calculate what the estate tax bill will be and ensure it now so that the payout to the charity in the future will completely cover the final estate tax bill. It's a win-win-win, and the only one who loses is the tax man. That's awesome, Terrence. Thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, uh, for tuning in again. Uh, this is um, Dollars with Sense. I'm Ella Lang. My co-host, Terrence Vanderwood, and I are here every Sunday. If you miss our show, you can uh, listen to our podcasts that are posted on Facebook. That's Dollars with Sense. Or you can read the transcript and look at our charts. Uh, have a coffee, sit down, and read through it, reread it. And if you have any questions or comments, by all means, please write to us at 2financialgurus at gmail.com. That's the number 2financialgurus at gmail.com. Or drop us a call. Call us at 778-879-0820. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. I'm Ella Lang uh, with co-host Terrence Vanderwood. And may your cents and dollars stay with you. <laughs>